So my dad was a Border Patrol agent in War Road, Minnesota. Uh, he retired 29 years as a Border Patrol agent. Um, I joined the military, I was in the 219th Security Force Squadron in Minot, North Dakota. Uh, so I was out there for six years. Um, then I transferred to the Fargo 119 Security Forces Squadron. And that's when I got, so then I went to, while I was in that, I went to school. I graduated from NDSU with a criminal justice degree in 2016. Um, while I was in my senior year of college, I met um, the time Sergeant Travis Stefanowitz, now Assistant Chief, um, at a career fair. And I talked to him quite a bit about what the Fargo Police Department had to offer, uh, which sounded very appealing to somebody just graduating from college. Uh, he had reached out to me as I was friends with Officer Brad Cernick, who had just started at the Police Department, and got my contact information and sent me an email asking me to take the, the hiring test. Um, and I was looking for a job at the time. So I took uh, the test, passed, interviewed, um, the background check and everything, and then eventually got hired um, in May, May 23rd, 2016. I then attended the North Dakota Law Enforcement Training Academy out in Bismarck in the summer of 2016. Um, and once I graduated from there, I started the PTO program on a day shift. And then I graduated the PTO program in early January of 2017, where I then worked night shift for about four and a half years, and then moved to days in March of 2021. So the reason I chose to become a Fargo police officer was all the options we had for an officer growth. And here, if you want to work patrol, investigations, be a school resource officer, be a SWAT team, a bomb squad, there's a lot of different options that you can choose your own career path and how you want to advance throughout the department. The reason I chose to become a patrol training officer was I had very good trainers that I came in to the department not knowing a whole lot, not knowing how to be a police officer. They trained me how to respond to calls, how to be good backup, good secondary officers, good primary officer. And I wanted to give back to the new uh, recruits that we had, that we have, and to teach them that way. Because I want my backup coming to help me. I want them to be trained and know what to do when they get there. Because if I'm in need of help, I want them to be able to respond appropriately um, to help me out in whatever situation I'm in. So you are essentially looking out for them. You, you want them to uh, act the right way, do the right things for the right reasons. Um, and for the most part, everybody does that, but you gotta steer them, steer them in like the correct direction in order to do that. Um, you're responsible for that new officer. Um, and you go on like a lot of calls together. There's like sometimes Throughout the day, you're going like call to call to call, but then sometimes you, you have some downtime in the car if nothing's going on, and that's when you get to know the person that you're riding with because one day they're going to pass the training program and you're gonna like, become friends with this person. I mean, it's happened before where I've trained people and now I'm friends with them after they're out of training. Um, so you wanna just get that, learn, figure out who they are um, where they come from, but you also have a job to do. You gotta, you're like their immediate supervisor, essentially. So Jake had completed phase A and B. Um, training's broken down into four phases, A, B, C, and D. Then you have a midterm between B and C, and then a final. So Jake had completed phase A and B, then was on his midterm. Uh, midterm is about, five to eight shifts, depending on kind of how the schedule works. Um, him and I, we were on our second week together. Uh, I think we had a three-day week, 
following by a five day. And so we're the second week, it was Wednesday. I was gone on Thursday at training, then Friday when this happened. Um, and before all this even happened, we, when we were driving shortly before the call for service, he was just asking how he was doing. I said, you're doing fine. Just keep doing what you're doing and you're going to pass. And he was, I mean, everybody gets nervous how you're going to, because you're being evaluated all the time. Obviously, we still do like teaching moments in there. Like I'm not going to let him fall on his face. Um, but the point is, is I, me as the evaluator, to, as a fresh set of eyes to see how he's doing and zero concerns whatsoever. Like he was ready to move on uh, into the later phases of training. Um, briefing typically lasts for about a half hour. Um, then Jake had set up the squad car, um, drove it outside. I go put my stuff in there uh, and then we go out for the day. But I was gone the previous day and he had a bunch of reports that he, that he still needed to finish up. And so we spent a large amount of time throughout the day just him trying to get caught up from the day before, um, which is common. I mean, you got a lot of stuff going on. You got training paperwork you got to accomplish and the reports on top of it that can all add up pretty fast. But he was taking the initiative and using good time management to get that done. And then um, we had gone on a car accident earlier in the day, um, handled it, no issues. Um, nothing else really sticks out. It was just playing a lot of catch up from the day before. Um, and then we were actually at the station when this, this accident, or driving, excuse me, we were driving back to the station when this call came out, got to the station. Um, Jake was signing onto a computer, getting ready to start his reports. And then we, we got asked to respond as a secondary officer to help Officer Haas and Dota's out with interviewing some witnesses on that crash. When we first got on scene, Officer Dota's uh, approached us and said that they had like six witnesses to interview uh, and just asked if we would help out with that. It was towards the end of the day and being a new officer can sometimes take a little bit. Uh, we had no issue stopping to help out. Um, as soon as we got there too, the uh, fire truck was going to take off. Those guys were going to leave. They weren't needed anymore. Um, and so Dotus and uh, Jake began walking to the side of the road to go speak with the witnesses. I just wanted to look at the car quick, see where the damage was. Um, so I was just like front end minor damage. And then I was walking back to just go move the squad car quick when the shooting began. We go to these accidents every day, um, just very minor property. Um, a lot of times at these accidents we'll just have People exchange their information if it's if it's um, very minor and no injuries. Um, nothing out of the ordinary at this accident. There was no indication there was any kind of threat. Um, nothing um, that would lead us to believe that we were in danger just by being out there. All right, so I looked at the front of the car, determined it was just a minor accident, but an airbag went out, had gone off. They were going to have the vehicle towed. I then was going to walk back to our squad car as the fire truck was going to take off just to help uh, traffic control better. Um, we had a stalled vehicle in the middle of the road. I didn't want somebody to drive by and rear end that car and cause another accident. So as I began to walk back to the squad car, I had made it like a step or two past the rear of the vehicle that was involved in the accident when the shooting started. So the other three officers when the shooting occurred were directly to the north of the suspect vehicle, um, maybe within 20 yards of them. Um, then no indication whatsoever that this was going to happen to them as they were walking over to talk to the, talk to the witnesses. Officer Dotus had already had one of the vehicles pull off to the side of the road before I'd even gotten there. And then the other vehicle in the road, the um, the driver, she was already on the side of the road with the other officers. So the car was empty, there's nobody in it at the time. I'd walked to the back of the, back to the um, 
victim car in the middle of the road. I had walked a step or two past it, um, yelled at Officer Dotas that I was gonna move the car. It was hard to hear out there, there was traffic going by. Um, and then I remember them looking over at me and then all of a sudden the shooting just started. I had been, I was by cover. I was concealed from that by that vehicle being there. So I immediately drew my pistol out, called over the radio, had shots fired, and then was trying to find out where they were coming from. Um, I then saw where the individual was at because he had gotten out of the car at that point and returned fire towards him. Um, after I did my first set of shots, he ran around the back of his vehicle and I lost sight of him. I again called out on the radio uh, that we had shots fired, not knowing at the time that three officers and a civilian had been hit. Um, he then started shooting again and I had a good line of sight from where I was at and I um, engaged him again from the, would have been the front of the victim vehicle in the middle of the road. I didn't see them right away um, I was focused in on him, trying to get him, get him down. Um, but I didn't know that the three were down until the suspect dropped. And that's when I ran around the vehicle, saw the three guys on the ground, um, called it out, and then, and then um, pushed past them because the suspect still wasn't down yet. He wasn't determined to be not a threat at that point. Um, since there were verbal commands, um, he didn't listen. Um, he continued to have a weapon in his hand. I continued to engage him. I uh, had to reload my pistol, um, engaged him again. And then um, I knew I had to get closer to him because um, at first, the initial volley of shots was about 75 feet um, and then after that I knew I had to get get closer because that's a fairly good distance with a pistol. I knew those guys needed medical attention now um, but I knew I had like every officer responding that was available and I just needed to get that guy down detained um, just like to get those guys help because I mean, I knew it was a rifle. Um, didn't know what kind, make, model, anything like that. But they were down, they weren't moving. So I had to get him detained before I could worry about anything else. Because if he's not detained, then all of us are still at risk of being hurt. I, moving out in the open, I lost all cover and concealment. Um, I was out in the open, essentially. Um, but he was down on the ground and his car was between him and I. And I knew he was down, I saw him fall. Didn't know if he was, if he was just wounded, if he was deceased, I had no clue. Um, so I pied around the front of the vehicle, which is what we're trained to do. Um, play your angles, um, give yourself a better position than what um, suspect has on you. I uh, pied around, saw he was still moving, gave multiple commands to him um, to put his hands up, stop moving. Uh, he failed to listen. He sat up with a pistol in his hand. I again engaged him, ran out of ammo. I um, reloaded pretty quick. I reloaded quick, uh, got back into the fight, um, shot again till he dropped. However, I knew at that time, like he still wasn't deemed to not be a threat. That's when I pushed around the front of the car to get closer to him. I flanked around to the west side, which is what the, um, his upper torso was. I wasn't getting effective shots uh, as his legs were towards me and not his upper body. Um, that's when I pushed around to the the west side in the trunk of his vehicle. Um, he had a pistol in his hand, again re-engaged, and the threat stopped at that point. Uh, we, so Officer Mike Clower then had arrived on scene right after that. Um, detained him in handcuffs, 
and then went and helped the other officers that were down. Um, just kept breathing, tried to control my breathing, um, stay focused on the threat because you know he's not down yet. Um, he still poses a threat till he's deemed not to be one. Um, so I just stayed focused on that. I mean, we're trained to, like an active shooter situation, you gotta go push past all injured people until the shooter is deemed not to be a threat anymore. It's still an active situation at that time where we need to get to him. We need to get him either detained um, or eliminate him. And it got to that point where he just had to be eliminated. Um, I think the big thing was is being um, physically fit, um, able to handle the stress, the breathing, um, being mentally aware through like training on what you need to do, what task has to happen, and then like your um, communication. You got to be talking, um, talking your breathing, um, visual, or, um, verbally saying what you want the person to do. Um, because every shot's got to be justified. Um, you got to know your use of force, what needs to be done, and what's what use of force is applicable. Um, so that's big. And then being like, like mentally prepared for it. Um, like I said, like training scenarios, um, knowing what you can and cannot do. Um, it's like your rules of engagement, essentially. You gotta let people know what's going on um, and where you're at. Otherwise, nobody can respond to help you. You need to let them know what they're coming into so the officers are, are mentally preparing on their way there. They may be coming from all the way across town. They may be coming from the station 10 blocks away, but that gives them a little bit of time to know what they're coming for. Um, and so you're trying to get as much information out as efficiently as possible. Um, then while you're doing that too, you're still in a gunfight, you're activating, you're, um, you're perceiving the threat, what to do, what the appropriate actions are that you have to take. Um, and then communicating towards the suspect what you want him to do. You may get good shots on him, he may drop and give up. That doesn't mean you can go up and continue to shoot. Then you go up, you detain him. Um, you have somebody post security on him and then you tend to the innocent people and the police officers. Um, but you have to be, um, you have to be like clear and concise with your statements that you're issuing. Um, hands up, drop the gun, stop moving, all those. And it's the simple, clear commands. So it's like there's no doubt what you want that person to do. Um, I needed help and I needed it now. I needed officers, I needed medical personnel, and I knew we had multiple people down. I don't know what else is going on in the city, but everybody that's available, I need help and I need it now. The gravity of everything hit, like, right after probably like the guy got detained and I was, I remember thinking to myself, I did the whole like check on myself, like am I hit or whatnot. I never said anything like verbally, but I was like, all right, feel your arms, feel your legs, wiggle your toes. Like, are you hit? Are you injured? And I wasn't, luckily. I'm telling myself just to calm down and relax and get your breathing back under control. Um, you're no good to anybody if you can't think straight. And you gotta be able to talk, communicate, um, tell everybody what's going on. So responding people can help you out. But it was like right away, I was very, like it hit me right away. And then getting back in the station and you got guys coming in on their off time, um, walking by the supervisor's office, like walking by, seeing me, coming in, giving me hugs and um, I was 
Still doesn't even seem real that it all happened. This was wearing my Apple Watch at the time. Um, and I knew my heart rate got up there. And uh, just my own curiosity, I looked back at it. I got up to, I think, 169 beats per minute from going from probably like 80 beats to jumping up 110 in the span of a couple minutes. I saw all three of them laying on the ground. I. So it was Jake, Andrew, then Tyler. Um, I saw Jake, saw it was fatal wound, moved on to Andrew. Um, Andrew was laying on his back. He was still moving. He still had all his uniform and everything on at that point. Um, fire department, they had just thrown it in reverse and waited until, waited it out until um, they determined they were good to come up. Um, so then I stayed with Andrew, Officer Dirk Tiedemann had arrived um, right around the same time I think that I got to Dotus. Um, started like triaging him, figuring out where he's wounded, um, how can we help him, what do we need to do to get him out of here. Um, remove his vest, duty belt, cut his clothes off. Um, saw that he obviously had multiple multiple injuries, uh, gunshot wounds. Uh, fire department paramedics were great at figuring out what to do. Um, we just get the basic trauma stuff, but they obviously have a more training experience dealing with gunshot wounds than all of us do just by their job status. Um, we had Officer Dotus loaded up fairly quick um, and off to the hospital immediately. Um, I personally didn't go over to Tyler. Uh, there was a lot of people that got on scene very fast as soon as, as soon as all the shooting stopped. Um, and everybody was finding work to do. So then I just was, I was um, mentally aware that I, what I was just involved in, I was involved in officer involved shooting. Um, and I needed to remove myself from the situation. Now that the scene was safe, there were other people there. Medics were there, fire department was there. And then I needed to um, remove myself from the situation. Um, and so then I was, I found the first supervisor, gave a quick statement, um, what happened basically, um, which direction I shot, suspects, victims. Uh, and then I got paired up with Officer Scott Normandon and him and I drove back to the station and waited for further instructions. Um, stay with us, um, stay awake. Mm -hmm. he, um, a couple different times closed his eyes, um, gave him a sternum rub, woke him back up. Um, he was obviously in quite a bit of pain and was was trying to roll around, get on his side. Um, but we needed to focus on his wounds and just told him to each had a hand, we're holding on to him. Um, and then had a medic get there right away. And then it's a lot of just stay with us, trying to keep us trying to keep focus on us. Um, he's always trained, like don't let him fall asleep. I knew his wounds were not good. Um, he wasn't bleeding a lot. He had a lot of internal damage. Um, and he needed to uh, get to the hospital now. Um, so as soon as he got, he got loaded up, he was first to get out of there. I did not think Andrew was going to live like at all. Um, I watched the color from his skin just go away and I knew he was losing a ton of blood and I mean I've seen people that have been shot before and where they're still alive but then they get taken away and they die and he looked just like that. Um, 
I went home and like fell asleep on the couch and just woke up to a text message on my phone um, from Brad Cernick and he said, hey, I'm outside your house right now. And um, walked outside and just talked to him and asked how Dotus was doing and he's like, yeah, he went into surgery and he's, he's doing good. And I was like, so like, so like Obviously, it was still serious, but it was like very happy, to, like relieving to hear that because I thought for sure he was going to tell me that he like didn't make it. Um, probably got my way home when I left. I didn't leave till eight thirty, nine o'clock. I called like my wife right after it happened. I think when I was. And still on scene, just said, "Hey, there was a shooting. I'm okay. Just let everybody. It's going to be a big, like, like it's going to be on the news. So let let everybody know." And I called my dad too and told him, "Like, hey, there was just a shooting, but I'm okay." And then nobody really knew that I was like an outsider, like the PD, like no family or anything knew that I was like involved in it until like. I like got back to the station, I think, and then I called my wife again, just said, hey, I was, I just shot a guy, and um, I'm not going to be home for a while, but I'm okay. And then let her know that like three other guys got shot, and then on the way home, called my mom and dad, too, and let them know that I was involved in it, and because they didn't know anything, they just you know, I've called them before when I've been at critical incidents and just said, hey, I'm fine. Um, but I think it's like, it was obviously a check for me too because I was very, very lucky that I wasn't right next to, right next to them because it would have been all four of us then. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think for them knowing that it was, it could have been, like a lot worse. And like I wasn't hurt physically or anything. I all just started crying right away, basically. I didn't really say too much. I just kind of told them what happened and it was I'm just thankful that I was okay. Um, you know, just a lot of emotions, obviously. They didn't expect to a phone call like that on a Friday afternoon because I called my dad. He's like, hey, Zach, how you doing? I'm like, I was just in a shooting. He was like, what? I'm like, you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. And he's like, all right, call me later. And then I called him on the way home. Or then I think I said I was involved in a shooting that was in a shooting. Uh, but he said my voice sounded different too. And he knew that like just his gut, probably fatherly instinct, knew that I was involved in it, but obviously didn't know the whole, like, nobody would have thought this would have happened here, right? Um, but it did. Um, and, I don't know, it was just a bad, bad day. It's definitely like reality like sets in because I mean you don't ever know like what your destiny is, what's gonna happen. Um, I mean you're going to a minor property crash and then this shooting happens where I've gone to hundreds of them before and nothing happens. It's get your information, leave onto the next call or go type the report, go home for the day. But then this happens and it's and it's like a big reality check you take every day for make the most of it. Um, I don't know, just puts everything in perspective that like, like Jeff and Amy don't have their son to call anymore. When I was like sitting at home on leave, I mean, it was nice to be home, but 
then you're just, you know, just sitting at home, like watching TV, wasn't doing anything productive with my life, other than like being a dad and taking care of a two-year-old, uh, which is fun too. But um, it was just good to get like structure back in. Um, still like plays in my mind like a thousand times a day and still doesn't seem like real that this even happened. Um, last two months have just been like a whirlwind. Um, I mean, it's been, I've had people reach out, very thankful for everybody, everything everybody's done for me. Uh, it's just to be grateful every day. I mean, I realize how close I was to like, like getting shot, not making it back. And I didn't get any, I wasn't wounded or anything, like, like Andrew, Jake, and Ty, right? But it was still like, you never think you're gonna be in a situation like that. Um, something so unexpected. Um, but Zach at noon on Friday, July 14th, and I was getting ready to go on vacation the following week and was helping Jake get through his midterm. I had paperwork to do myself for it. Um, just get everything done. Um, we're now like today, it's like, how do you say it? Like, I don't know. The big thing is just to be grateful for what you got and um, found myself being more patient now too. Um, not that I was ever impatient before, but you, know, you go on like being back to work like some, like say you're at a, I've been to car accidents since then where I've been to hundreds of car accidents before, but this might be this person's first accident. I think I've done a better job of like explaining stuff to them, like, like why we need certain information and whatnot. No, no, I wanted to come back right away. Um, I was obviously needed the time off, but when they said, when I had the opportunity to come back, I took one week off for myself. And then I'm sitting at home, I'm like, I need to get back and get around everybody, see everybody again. Um, I knew when I came back, it was gonna be a lot of conversations with people asking me how I was doing, um, which I'm gr very grateful for. Um, but I was glad to get back and see everybody again, because it had, I had been very busy those couple weeks. Um, like my wife told me like you were off work, but you weren't really off, like you were busy every day. I'm like, yeah, I know, it's, it's a lot, lot going on, a lot more than I ever thought would be going on. Um, but there's no question, like I wasn't gonna not come back to work. Like, like I wasn't job hunting or anything. I was, I'm fully content where I'm at right now. You, know, you look at other um, shootings that have happened, whether it's like in other states, other parts of the country, whatever, um, and try to learn from them. Um, how, how would you react? How would you perform? Uh, would you do it the same? Would you do it better? Would you do it worse? Um, and then this happens and you go into fight or flight mode and Luckily, I chose fight versus flight. Um, but yeah, it was, I don't think I ever had like the worst vision, obviously like, like probably there's been some pretty high profile like school shootings and stuff lately and you hope you'd react and, and um, stop the threat as quick as you possibly can. But you don't know how you're gonna respond, how you're gonna react until you get in that situation. And 
I had my situation. Um, I reacted and didn't didn't freeze, didn't wasn't thinking about what to do, what what should I do, like what policy say. It was I just reacted and didn't have to think about it, which is how you're trained to do. You shouldn't have to think about it in a situation like that. It should just be all reaction. But it just reinforces the fact of why you train, um, why you shoot till you run out of ammo and you reload. So that when you're doing it real life, it's just you don't even have to think about it, you react. Remember I ran dry, didn't even cross my mind, you get put cover between you and the suspect, reload, and get back into it. Um, and that was like the same, like in the military too, like you, you shoot five rounds, reload, shoot five more, um, or whatever combination you have. Um, but yeah, it's, it just shows why you, why you practice, practice, practice. Um, because you hopefully practice and you never have the game, but, and I guess we like refer it towards sports, right? But this happened and like I performed um, how I was trained to do, which I feel like anybody else would have done the same thing. Very grateful um, for the community, even just like driving around, seeing all the blue lights, everybody that obviously cares about all of us. Um, and I know just not just me been checked in on, it's been every member at the department. Um, people have checked in on them to see how they're doing too because everybody was affected. I mean, I just happened to be the right place at the right time, but it could have been anybody else too. You know, I'm just grateful that I was in like the right place to do what I needed to, right place, right time uh, to do what was needed to be done because I got, I've said it before, I was very, very lucky how things panned out um, for me personally. Um, the suspect, I don't think ever saw me, didn't know where I was, didn't know where he was getting shot at from. Um, and I was just able to, like I said before, just react and um, eliminate him before he had the chance to hurt anybody else, um, which I think, I mean, like you put another unit gets sent there, they do the same thing, right? Um, but I was just, Like I said, right place, right time. And if I'm standing next to those three other guys, I'm in the hospital too, or, or you know, I don't make it, I don't know. I don't know what would have happened. I played the what if game and it's not a good road to go down. A lot. I don't know like what would have happened had he been able to get away because I've seen pictures from the street fair before and um, I know a ton of people go there. I talked to when I met with the attorney general and then um, and when I met with U.S. Attorney Max Schneider and his office overlooks I think Second Avenue North or First Avenue North looking towards Broadway and he said he looked out the day of that shooting when he found out and, and people were just packed in there enjoying a Friday afternoon and had he gone there gotten all four of us you send every officer in the city in the metro to 800 block 25th Street and then he goes downtown and starts shooting with that binary trigger and there would have been tons of casualties. Other wounded, deceased, it would have been horrible. 
And same if he goes out to the the fairgrounds and does the same thing. It's it would have been a disaster. Um, I'm not working. I'm my son just turned two, uh, and he acts like he's in his mid twos. Um, as far as like hobbies, I like to go golfing, play hockey. Um, Two-year-olds kind of put a little pump the brakes on that. Um, but going to work out every morning, that's one of my big hobbies is going to the gym before work. Um, try to go like deer hunting every year. Um, so hopefully November I'll get out. Um, pheasant hunting. I just like to be outside and I get sick of being inside. Yep, that's, that's outstanding that we've got candidates like that, that they don't even bat an eye, like they know what, what the job entails and they're, um, they still completed their academy. They're all out on PTO program right now, whether they're on days, evenings, nights. Um, trying to learn the job so they can um, be one of us, be a full-time officer. Um, yeah, they, I mean, they had, they had the out if they wanted it, and none of them took it, which is just remarkable. Because um, they're brand new to this. If they would have seen, I mean, they obviously saw what happened, and if, uh, we've had people that have worked here in the past where they realized, hey, this isn't for me. Um, and that's okay. It's not for everybody, right? Uh, if you want to go do a different career, um, you try it out, it's not for you. Okay, you give a shot, no hard feelings, right? Um, but they're all out there now um, learning uh, to be police officers. So that's just, it's great. I'm happy for all of them. At the time, I didn't have time to think about that. Um, I had so many things going through my mind at that moment where, in hindsight, yeah, it was bad. I had no backup. Um, I needed help, and I needed help now. I just needed another set of hands just to help me with everything. But at the time, I didn't have that. You work with what you got, and I had me. Um, so I knew that I had to keep pushing forward. I knew I had to get this guy down, need to get him in handcuffs. Um, what that took was deadly force. Um, but then I knew too, once I got the radio transmission out that I had everybody coming to help me. And I could hear the, hear the sirens, I mean, they're you can hear them from a ways away. And um, I know they're, everybody was trying to get there as fast as they could. Uh, we usually send two people to call for service depending on what it is. Um, but that day, I mean, there was four of us there. And then it went from four to one real quick. Um, yeah, it's like going back to earlier where you, where you don't have time to like think about it, you just got to react. And I to get on the radio, tell people what you need, you need to be clear, concise, um, to the point with what you need so everybody knows. That just comes with time and experience, like getting out pertinent information. I had people there within what, three minutes, which seems like it is a long time when you're in that situation, but in the grand scheme of things, it's pretty quick to get people there. That many people there, that many resources. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, so Andrew and I, we worked on nights together and then days and 
Um, unfortunately, I didn't know Tyler very well. He's in training. And we always talked about how we need to hang out outside of work. Um, work together every day, know everything about him, but you go home, you go home to your wife, go home to your kid, and then like, see you in 14 hours. Um, that's definitely changed. Our, all of our wives have gotten to know each other now. Um, um, it's definitely like different. Like you get that bond now with them because uh, we were there. Like a lot of people were there. A lot of people um, responded. Um, obviously, we're close with everybody. Um, but to be there, knowing that it was just like it was like four of us there and um, it's definitely different now. Um, so I've, I've had the opportunity now to meet them a couple times. Um, very wonderful family. Um, was at the Bison game with them um, last Saturday. Uh, and we got to go out in the field with them too and uh, when Jake was recognized and then just kind of got to hang out and talk with them. Um, at the football game, which is really nice because it's, I mean, they, they live three hours away. It's not easy to, to see them on a regular basis, uh, but just cherish the time we get with them. Um, I don't even know what they're going through. They got, uh, after having like, yeah, I just can't imagine like having a kid and then having that happen to him. Yeah. So I knew there would be like the people in Fargo, but I did not expect to be in like Moorhead, Dilworth, Dilworth Glendon, Audubon, Holly, Lake Park, all the way to Pequot Lakes, like that was, I had no idea that was going to happen. Um, it was very quiet going through the cities, like every little city on the bus, like it was just soaking it all up and um, did not imagine that it would be like that. Um, and then nation, like, I mean, you got the U.S. Attorney General come to town to talk to to us that were involved. Um, never would have expected that to happen. Having the video being broadcasted everywhere um, on the news and something I never thought would happen. Like I knew like locally it would happen, um, but as far as getting out there and um, having it be seen everywhere was just, did not expect it to happen. Um, like I said earlier, I am very grateful. Would have not expected anything like this. I mean, there's been shootings before in Fargo where um, an officer's not hit or anything, and it's kind of it's hot news for a week, and then it's kind of every once in a while as the investigation continues more stuff comes out, but this, I would not expect this. Um, it, uh, very like humbling to know that that many people care about you. Um, Cause I would have never, I mean, we never planned for this to happen, right? But um, to know that I have people from high school that I haven't talked to in 15 years, reach out just to see how you're doing. Um, friends on Facebook, Instagram that I never talked to that send me messages, hey, hope you're doing well. Um, just never would have thought that would happen. So I left the house at like four o'clock and she was fast asleep <laughs> still. <laughs> so, but she obviously texts me when I, when she wakes up and 
um, it was good to get back. I didn't have any, I didn't have like the jitters coming back. I mean, I was paired up with another officer, which was good. Um, rode in the passenger seat, just luckily we didn't have too much going on that day. Um, but it was good to get back and like knock the dust off. And after like the first call for service, I was like, all right, I'm back. Like, Obviously, it's still a lot going on in your mind, but um, being paired up with somebody, like one of my friends helped out quite a bit. Um, and then two, I think Ashley knew that I was ready to go back. She wasn't ready for me to go back, but like I told her, it's like I gotta like, like rip off the Band-Aid and because like, she wanted me to stay on desk duty till after the baby was born. I'm like, I'm not going six months without working. So I went back. I think now I feel like going through this situation, say, like, God forbid this happens again, but say like a scenario similar happens, right? I can be like, talk them through like, hey, this is gonna happen. Um, everybody's very grateful that you're okay and whatnot. Um, you're gonna have a lot of people try to contact you and try to coach them through that. Um, and just be like, like a good resource for, you know, I'll, I'll keep doing PTO. Um, I don't have any regrets doing it. Um, looking back, like nothing, nothing could have been changed that day. Um, with the PTO, PTO trainee, like I'm responsible for safety welfare of the trainee. Um, but I mean, there's nothing that could have been done differently. Um, if I get approached tomorrow and say, hey, you're gonna have trainee for three weeks, it's like, okay. Like I'm ready to go back into that role. I wanna put in for sergeants after this incident just to be um, a leader for all the other officers out on the street. Um, when you're in that position, you are the point of contact when they have a question, they contact you. Um, if a supervisor is needed, and I feel like um, throughout training experience, whatnot, I have a pretty good understanding on how to answer a majority of questions. Um, that will arise from being in that position. Um, you have to have a good understanding of how the department works, um, what goes on, um, but getting into that position too, there's a lot that you have to learn um, that I as a patrol officer don't see. Um, so then as a sergeant too, um, you're a mentor and a leader to the other, to the patrol officers that are out on the street you need to be able to give quick and clear answers um, during particular situations. Um, one of my sergeants that I've had in the past, he, you'd call him, he had an answer for you right now. Um, and somebody I look up to still. And, he, and if he didn't have an answer for you, he would get back to me like, I'll let you know. And that's about building those resources um, to know who to contact, to find out what you need to know. My best memory, I mean, I, I couldn't put a, it's probably the memories, like the people that I've met doing this. Um, I've met a lot of citizens, obviously, 
uh, community members, whatnot. But I've also developed a lot of lifelong friends by working at the police department. Um, our kids play together. We have get-togethers at each other's houses. Um, and I would have never got those relationships had I not applied to work here. Um, yeah, Had I not been recruited, essentially, um, I wouldn't have all my friends. And I mean, I've got outside friends, obviously, but a lot of like my really good friends work at the Fargo Police Department. Tell them just to try it out. Um, if you get hired, start training, realize it's not for you, okay, nobody's gonna think any less of you. Um, but you may really love it and you may have fun. Um, come to work every day, you don't know what you're gonna encounter, who you're gonna talk to, you don't know what situations, what problems you're gonna have to solve. Um, that's what makes it a great job. Probably Jake's family dealing with the loss of him. Um, I just, after having like a son, I just can't even imagine. And then like, then winter losing your fiance too. It's like, I don't know what I would have done if I'd been in that situation. I don't know, it's horrible. I've had multiple people tell me that, like, I'm glad you were there that day. And uh, say 20, three years from now when I hit 30 years to have somebody come up to me like a could even be a brand new person be like I'm glad like you were my supervisor I'm glad you were there to help in this situation like that's like the biggest honor to hear that from other from other cops is to say like I'm glad you were there to help out 